this is something I've kind of wanted to talk about for a little bit. And there's an article from Left Voice that does a really good job. I'm only going to read uh, a, a portion of it, uh, basically the the bottom portion of it. There's there's it seems like there's a lot, uh, but we'll 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 fly through it. It'll be it's it's like three or four sections. Actually, I am going to start right with the Stonewall Rebellion. Um, again, I, I recommend that you guys go check this article out. I'll scroll up so you can see what the title of the article is. Uh, it's a guest article, which I guess they're doing a lot more of uh, on, on Left Voice. They've, there's been a lot of guest articles, uh, and it's called From Stonewall to Black Lives Matter. And you can see here uh, Black Trans Lives Matter as part of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and uh, it's very in-depth. There's a lot that they cover. Uh, but for the sake of time because you know i don't want the segment to run too too long i want to try to wrap this up as close to 5 30 as possible uh i will i'm going to pick this up at the section labeled the stonewall rebellion and i always encourage people you know please go and check out these articles for yourselves uh you know and if you if you disagree with me come back and leave a comment on the stream and uh, i'm happy to uh respond to it uh, on a future stream or or directly in the comment section. Um, I will say the one thing that I do wish Rockfin would do is is have a reply option to comments. Uh, but again, they're a growing, evolving uh, platform. So I, I'm going to be patient with them on that. So let's, let's read this thing. So this is a Stonewall Rebellion. While the LGBTQ political organization, uh, organizing certainly existed before Stonewall, most notably the 1966 Compton Cafeteria Riots in San Francisco. Most of the work was underground, non-confrontational, and muzzled by McCarthyism. Here we go. We're bringing McCarthyism back into it. Look at that. Even the LGBTQ community was uh, were, were victims of McCarthyism. Nobody escapes this fucking insidious piece of shit propaganda. Like, I fu it's just so fucking stupid. It's just paranoid, dumb, idiotic, nonsensical, irrational ideology. And it's stuck with this country because it knew how to use fear properly. That's what most propaganda is. It used fear and everything else that, that, that they wanted you to be scared of. They roped into fucking fear prime, McCarthyist, Russiagate bullshit that has no standing in fact. That has no standing in fucking rational. Can you really, can you tell I fucking hate this? I, I hate it so fucking much. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, anyway, that started to change, however, as the civil rights movement unfolded and many young gay activists were inspired by black activists who, who defied police terror and racist oppression. Early gay rights or organizations such as the New York's Matanishin Society. I am so sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, and then the San Francisco-based Society for Individual Rights began to take more militant and um, an unapologetic turn. Uh, Frank Kameni, an early gay activist, declared not only is homosexuality not immoral, but homosexual acts engaged in by consenting adults are moral, right, good, and desirable for both individual participants of the society. Gay rights groups began organizing public de demonstrations and sip-ins uh, to demand the decriminalization of homosexuality and end to anti-gay harassment at bars. Uh, and, and what uh, Frank Kameni is talking about is healthy sexual behavior and it's and it's, it's so interesting to me that you know uh, a lot of gay activism gay activism lgbtq activism my apologies for that uh rhetoric it's just being used a lot in this article because they you know they it comes from a little bit of a different era before the lgbtq title was set into place my apologies if i switch uh vernacular every so often uh, but the LGBTQ rights activists always talk about healthy sex. They always talked about consensual sex uh, and safe sex and being and and comfortable sex, right? What are you what are you comfortable with? What are your limits? What com communicating and being open about that sort of stuff? That is not preached in 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 the 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 more religious societies, right? The the communication of that sort of stuff. Whereas in in, in this, it's kind of encouraged. Why wouldn't you want that, right? Why wouldn't you want a healthy communicative sex life with your partner or with whoever you're deciding to engage in that act in? 
And if, if the homosexual community is advocating for that, it becomes very difficult for you to demonize that, right? Especially when a lot more of society in the 60s was starting to open up about this sort of stuff. That's when the hippies were coming around, right? That's when the free love movement was kicking into play. So we'll continue. Uh, in May 1969, a young gay leftist in San Francisco named Carl Whitman penned a gay manifesto, an essay that would soon become a defining document, document in the gay liberation movement. Uh, Whitman's words illustrate the radicalization taking place among young gay militants and highlights the connection connections activists were beginning to make between homophobia, state repression, and police violence. His statement was a harbinger of things to come. So this is his statement here. Straight, straight cops patrol us. Straight legislators govern us. Straight employers keep us in line. Straight money exploits us. And we have to pretend everything is okay because we haven't been able to see how, change, how to change it. Uh, we've been afraid. In the past year, there has been an awakening of gay liberation. How it began? We don't know. Maybe we were inspired by black people and their freedom movement, uh, where once there was frustration, alienation, cynicism, there are new characteristics among us. And as we recall, all the self-censorship and repression for so many years, a reservoir of tears pours out of our eyes. We are full of love for each other and are showing it. We are full of anger at what has been done to us. And we are euphoric, high, and with initial flourish of a movement. You hear this sort of rhetoric in the Black Lives Matter movement, in the labor movement, any movement that really pushes back against oppressive uh, totalitarian governments, which, you know, our government is approaching that. I mean, there's literally a piece of legislation that says, hey, rat out your fucking socialist friends, uh, and we'll, we'll basically say that they're radicalized terrorists. There's a piece of legislation out there right now that wants you to do that under the Biden administration, which everybody was like, oh, it's all going to be all about freedom. No, I fear Isabel kind of call, called it and on the convo couch, put, put a term to it that I really loved. It's crypto fascism. That's what the Biden administration is. It's going to be in the technicalities. It's going to be in that technicalities. But look, these guys, you know, they were like, hey, maybe we were inspired by the black liberation movement. You know, who knows? It doesn't matter, though. What we know is we're standing with oppressed people because we are also oppressed people. So the black civil rights movement and the gay civil rights movement are basically one and the same. They're fighting against the same system, the same system that wants to dehumanize them uh, because it was profitable to. And now that it's profitable to humanize them, they are completely ignoring the history of dehumanization that they have the, the rainbow capitalism shit you know and, and again i talked about this with what they how they you uh utilize black people in that movement too they take figures from the black lives matter movement or any sort of civil rights movement and then they make them an icon and use it to sell shoes or whatever the fuck they want to sell completely ignoring the fact that just less than 50 years ago you know, they were arresting gay people at bars for being gay, ignoring that black people were being hosed down. Platitudes aren't enough. The, the pieces of legislation that were passed in this era still exist to this day and are getting updated. And they're using their fucking legalese and they're using their technicalities to skirt around the issue. So here, here's we'll, we'll get into this. So the Stonewall Inn was one of New York City's most popular gay bars in the 1960s. Sitting at the crossroads of Christopher Street and 7th Avenue in Greenwich Village, a neighborhood known for its bohemian lifestyle, uh, the Stonewall was dark and had two bars, a jukebox, and the only dance, uh, only floor for dancing in the whole city. It became the epicenter for the gay world of New York, especially for its more, most marginal members and regularly drew an electric crowd of cruising gay men, drag queens, street kids, and lesbians. At the beginning of the decade, laws across the U.S. were more repressive against homosexuals than that of any Soviet regimes 
that the U.S. frequently criticized. So again, you know, we we criticize Russia for being racist, for Russia for being homophobic, but here we are in this country. We still have fucking conversion camps. That's still a thing in America. But no, yeah, Russia is the problem. We had laws less than 50 fucking years ago criminalizing being a homosexual. But yes, Russia is the problem. Democrats a decade ago were demonizing gay people. And now all of a sudden, let's wear the rainbow pin and please vote for me. Uh, a, a consenting adult who has uh, caught having sex with another person of the same sex could face decades or even life in prison or could be confined to an insane asylum and subjected to electroshock therapy, castration, or lobotomy. But Russia's the problem. Uh, adults who were charged with a sex offense could lose their professional license and were often terminated from their jobs uh, and barred from future employment. But Russia's the problem. That was happening in the United States. These are all how authoritarian governments behave. Sex was not, uh, not the only thing that could get you in trouble. Clothes could too. That could be a problem for anyone <clears throat> uh, brave enough to uh, defy gender norms. Transgender people, cross-dressers, and drag, dr drag and street queens were targeted by and criminalized by the state. Wearing more than three items of clothing in New York City that did not correspond to one's assigned gender was illegal and could result in uh, arrest and imprisonment. Across the nation, gendered clothing laws that began to appear in the mid-19th century stayed on the books for decade regarding buried gender expressions illegal. Again, this is happening in the United States. The United States was keeping 19th century clothing laws on the books just to discriminate against gay people in America. Corporations were fine with this. Politicians were fine. Politicians that are still in office today were fine with this. I bet you Joe Biden was cool with this because old Joey B's hung out with fucking clansmen and people calling to for segregation segregationists i believe they were called while bars provided a place for gay people to meet one another and socialize in a repressive society it also made them a target for police uh again this is the, the, they were they would raid gay bars right like is that what happens in a democracy you get ra your bars and houses get raided by the cops for your identity to make sure no one's expressing love the way they choose to express love. Does that sound like a democracy to you? I don't know. One might say that sounds quite fascist, but that's just me. Late on a Friday night, uh, in June 1969, police busted into the Stonewall, demanding that all patrons line up and show their IDs. The cops planned to arrest bar employees, cross-dressers, uh, and those without proper identification. Those would be the street kids that would probably show up to these bars and look for a place outside of the fucking, uh, outside of the, the cold, you know, and they were probably taken in by these folks, helping them, help, help helping some people down in their luck. Uh, the night... The police that that night, the police were more aggressive than usual. They tore the they tore apart the bar, smashed the furniture and were physically aggressive with patrons who talked back. Unlike previous raids that came uh, that came early in the night, police shut down the stone wall during peak hours, whereas normally patrons would disperse after being kicked out, knowing they could return later. This time they began to gather outside the bar. The crowd of a few dozen eventually swelled to a few hundred. Thousands of gay residents poured out into the streets. The uprising was multiracial, diverse, and reflected a broad spectrum of the LGBTQ community. Many eyewitnesses commented specifically on the important role played that night by the most marginalized sections of the community, street kids, trans women, and queer youth of color. This is the thing that frightens the state, uh, the American state the most. 
is people of different backgrounds coming together for a singular cause. The singular cause being, we're sick and tired of being persecuted for our identity. Cross racial barriers, cross gender barriers. It's not just a black issue. It's not just a woman's. It's a human rights issue. And it doesn't matter what identity you belong to. And really, it doesn't matter what class you belong to either. But really, it's the lower classes that are going to come band together on this. We'll fight back for human rights issues. That's what they're afraid of. That's why the propaganda needs to be so heavy. That's why McCarthyism became so easy to use. Because it, it split us up on a class level. Because they centralized it with labor. So communists that were labor organizers or, or, or union organizers were threats, were traitors to America. Uh, but when the paddy wagon arrived, the mood changed drastically. Angry onlookers began throwing count coins at police and then moved on to bottles, cobblestones, and trash can. A full-fledged riot broke out. Later that night, the riot squad arrived and a, a night-long chase between gay and trans protesters and police ensued expecting to easily disperse the crowd uh, of people that society had labeled sissies and faggots. Sorry for the uh, awful word there. And stereotyped as weak, the police were caught completely off guard when the protesters fought back. Same thing happened in the fucking 30s, man. Like, no, they they didn't expect the, the labor organizers to fight back. So they called the National Guard and they were like, well, we'll threaten them with violence. They're not going to fight back. They're a bunch of, you know, sissies and shit. Ooh, organize. No, they fucking fought back. Tear gas canisters were thrown at the organizers. They threw the fucking canisters right back at the cops. They started throwing shit, disarming the cops, pulling out their own fucking guns. What do you think got us the Wagner Act? It's because, yes, yeah, state-sponsored violence wasn't taken lying down. They pushed back. When you when they asked peacefully, you didn't fucking listen. And then the propaganda gets turned into what? So so they're 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 the, the propaganda, the the stereotype is that these organizers, regardless of whether they're LGBTQ or labor or what have you, are sissies. They're not gonna fight back. They're emasculated people. And then when it turns out that it's not, oh, look at look at the sheer violence that the yeah, well, who started the violence? They're defending themselves. That's what these people did. Anyway, uh, pioneering transgender activist Celia Rivera was uh, was a part of Friday Night's uprising, which she would later describe as a turning point for her life. When a friend tried to convince her to leave, she said, "Are you not? I'm I'm not missing a minute of it. It's the revolution." And that's what it was. It was it was a revolution. Again, that's why we uh, celebrate Pride today. Um, and there's there's a lot more, a lot more to this this article, right? And where where they talk about how um, th this is a this is a revolution. This this is this was a rebellion of sorts against what was considered to be the norm. Um, and. It, it had it not been for that, had it not been for the Stonewall riots, had it not been for them, and it wasn't a riot to begin with. You, you know, all they did was gather and say, "Hey, we're sick and tired of this shit. We don't want to be kicked out of our bars. We don't want to be kicked out of our homes. We don't want to lose our jobs. We want to be who we want to be. Being who we are has nothing to do with whether we can drink at a bar or be a fucking accountant." And they pushed back, and it took a really long time. Because they had to continue pushing back, but eventually it led to where we are today, where the whole month of June is dedicated to pride. We see parades, we see fucking capitalism joining on board with it. Same thing fucking happened with Juneteenth. All of a sudden, last year it became a big thing that Trump was going to do a rally in Tulsa on Juneteenth without knowing what fucking Juneteenth was, and everybody talked about Juneteenth. And now this year it's like, oh, well, we're going to make it a fucking national holiday. Oh, by the way, we're not going to end the prison slavery. We're not going to end wage slavery. We're not going to defund the police and stop police brutality of people of color. We're not going to end the drug war. We're not going to legalize cannabis. We're not going to, but we are going to gesturally say that we like black people in this country. So what does that mean? That means that we got to do what, what the labor movement in the 30s did and what the LGBTQ community did at, at Stonewall. We got to push back in whatever way we can. 
violence is not my cup of tea, but talking about this shit and having discussions with regular people and exposing them to the to, to the history of oppression, the history of violence, the history of capitalist uh, destruction is something that I try to do as much as I can and amplify stories like this and get it out there. You might have a different way of doing it. You might be an organizer. You might be an activist. You might be someone that can get in the ear of politicians and try to fucking talk to them about this shit. And let them know, hey, there's a large movement building. And, you know, if you throw cops at it, it will become violent. What's the old, uh, I think it's a Kafka rule. If you if you introduce a gun in the first act, by the second act, it needs to go off. Yeah, well, we've been in the second act for a very long time. They introduced the gun in the first act of this country. And now we're in the second act where the gun is being used nonstop. And we're going to use our own. You didn't listen when we asked nicely, did you? Let's look at your comments. Sorry, I'm scrolling through. Uh, where are we at? Cynical Girl says, you and your switching vernacular. <laughs> Uh, Climate Rebel points out McCarthyism equals cultism. Uh, yes, I agree with you. I think I think it is it is cult like mentality, but that's uh, where the Democrats have gone now. They've become this cult like figure. Uh, Holly Horn, homosexuality was considered a mental illness, and for quite some time, I think only very recently uh, was it not was transgenderism not considered a. Uh, um, mental illness. I believe the DSM. I I, used, I I wrote a bit about it at one point, um, about how it's considered a mental illness. I'll try to throw that. I'll try to throw that. I don't know if you guys noticed, but like in the intros of these live streams, the the stand up clips that I choose are correlated to the subject matter. I'm sure some of you guys noticed, but a little fun fact, a little behind the scenes. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll I might try to put up a segment of that in the in the intro for tomorrow because i want there's some other stuff that i want to talk about regarding stonewall for tomorrow um holly points out the drag queens used their heels fuck yeah they did yeah that'd be awesome um cynical girl says here we are in this country where they'll propagandize you into thinking at least we're not the at least we're not sa what's sa i don't think i know what that is uh it's a jedi mind fuck yeah uh holly horn says pink triangles in nazi germany oh is that what they used to de demarc homosexuals that's pretty fucking uh that's pretty fucked up i didn't know that they they that's what they used uh don't worry and i i'm going to talk about this on friday show a little bit too but uh israel has implemented their own way of identifying people from gaza and west bank they, you know, learn, learn, learn from the oppressors to become the oppressors kind of thing. They have different colored IDs that limit the movement of Palestinians. So, again, you know, this is how oppressors operate. They like to use little insignias um, and little color coded things. They're very good at they're very good at like weird type A organizational shit. Right. I think that's why the, that, that's why people don't see America. Oh, Saudi Arabia. OK, um, thank you for clarification. But I think that's why, like, people don't see America as 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 corporatist and as fascistic of a state as it is, is because it's it's all about the paperwork, right? It's all about the uh, the 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 specific categories that they implement on these groups. It's not in your face with with the military, you know, trying to come into your homes and put a fucking pink triangle on your on your jackets or whatever. It's it's a little bit more subtle. It's a lot of paperwork involved. Uh, yeah. Uh, Climate Rebel, but see, had we all shown up with the LGBT community at Stonewall, they wouldn't have needed violence. Uh, agreed. I think I think once you start seeing huge groups of people, it scares the shit out of them, and scares the shit out of cops. Uh, it scares the shit out of the protectors of rich people's stuff. And then they go, yeah, maybe we shouldn't fucking do anything. Maybe we should back off. Maybe we need to start changing some shit. 
Uh, and this is why it's like I try to talk to people with different opinions and different viewpoints than me to try to get them to see that we're all in the same fucking fight and what they think are evil, what they think are bad are actually good. And they're meant to improve their lives. And the reason why they call it bad and they convince you that it's bad is because they don't want you to improve your life. I've talked to so many conservatives about socialism and started to move the dial in their head that socialism is not an evil thing in this planet and started to move the dial to see like, oh, capitalism is a cancer that is spreading voraciously throughout this planet. All right, folks, uh, I think we are going to wrap this psalm bitch up uh, as a la last point of note here. Uh, Climate Rebel says overwhelm them with numbers. Uh, I say we need to have Woodstock to. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I I like that plan. I like that plan. Let's Woodstock two would be a pretty fucking cool plan. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this video. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure you hit the like button and please make sure you share this content out. Sharing is very important. Sharing is how independent media gets the word out there about topics that corporate media doesn't even want to mention on their networks. So it's really up to you guys. Corporate media very much depends on the people. We are people powered media. That's what we really are. Uh, another great way to help if you're on stable financial ground is to uh, make a financial contribution to this channel. And you can do so over at krishmohanhaha.com slash donate. You can become a sustaining member, which gets you free tickets, early access to videos, bonus stand-up comedy and storytelling content, uh, a way for you to communicate directly with me, ask me questions, and other uh, premium content that uh, will be released on a monthly basis. Um, or you can make a one-time donation as well on that same website. Um, I also have uh, various stand-up comedy albums. I have about six comedy albums out right now uh, that are available on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. And most of them, if you get them off of Bandcamp, are available for a dollar or a, a pay-what-you-want pricing. And I also want to mention that I do have an online merch store. Uh, you can go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com, click on the merch tab, and check out all of the designs that I've made myself. And the Julian Assange shirt, there is a Julian Assange shirt that's on the website. All the profit from the Julian Assange designs will be going to uh, pro-Assange activists, such as Action for Assange, uh, Kevin Gastola, Richard Methurst, folks uh, 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 that, that are covering and talking about Assange. So I'm going to be making donations to them. Um, uh, it'll be 100% of the profits I make off of that shirt. Uh, thank you again for tuning in. Thank you again to all the people that have made contributions to the show, that regularly check out my content, that have subscribed to my channels. I, I very, very much appreciate it, and uh, and you guys help keep this uh, keep keep this this train a moving. So I, I very much appreciate that. Until the next video, we'll see you on the road. See you guys.